what is going on, everybody? Welcome to the Week 10 edition of the Pro Football Focus Show here on Roto Grinders. Uh, I am Britt Devine, uh, joined uh, back from Florida. Now, Ian, you didn't visit my favorite place in Florida, uh, but you did have fun down there at the wedding. How was that? And uh, w- welcome back. We've passed the halfway point in NFL. Uh, lots to talk about this week. It was a fantastic time. My voice was hurting on the Sunday night uh, podcast. I got about three out. I got the old uh, 545 flight out on Sunday. Had to, of course, watch the UFC pay-per-view the night before. So was running out of only a couple hours of sleep uh, to start the week. But I am back, rested, Brit, and ready to attack uh, this Week 10 slate. Also happy to see uh, that my boy Andrew came in, got a two-on-one record on the best bets. And, you know, it's a PFF tally, Brit. So, yes, I will be adding those <laughs> to my win-loss record. Hey, whatever it takes. And uh, again, uh, thank you to Andrew for filling in for you. You did an admirable job uh, going over your article and giving solid advice. Uh, but uh, Ian, like this show is great because like we record this on Friday afternoon. That's when all the injury stuff sort of hits. So I think we have a little bit better grasp on what's going to happen this week than maybe we did uh, if we recorded this on Thursday or even earlier in the day. And we'll discuss some of that uh, during the show for all of you uh, late Friday weekend listeners. Uh, but Ian, we always start the show off by going over your article over on Pro Football Focus. Uh, we call it the mismatch manifesto on this show. Uh, you have it the biggest fantasy football mismatches of week 10. Uh, you can go read that for free over on Pro Football Focus. Ian was nice enough uh, to lobby uh, Mr. Collinsworth to have maybe it didn't go that far up the chain. Uh, but we, we, we like to pretend it does on the show here. Uh, so you can go read that over for free on PFF. Uh, we sort of, I don't know, Ian, we get new listeners all the time, new viewers on YouTube. Why don't you tell the people what this article goes over and what we hope to accomplish with it? Yeah, just quickly, you know, we all talk about mismatches, just, you know, either casually or just, you know, in more fantasy football serious uh, form. But basically, it always comes down to offense ranks X and Y stat, defense ranks Z and Y stat. So instead of just always having this two way street, I combined about six metrics and explosive plays, pressure, pace, running game, pass game, EPA, just to help, you know, better visualize and quantify exactly what we're talking about in terms of those matchups. So, Britt, we start things off with explosive plays as always and you know two really big ones on the main slate sticking out as a setup well to make some big plays down the field and they are Ben Roethlisberger as we know that can uh, be a little bit of a struggle for him a bit, bit more of a factor of the Detroit Lions being so bad against the pass than anything he's done with that said no Claypool kind of condenses things down to mm-hmm. Deontay and maybe even James Washington sitting there at just 3.5k and also Carson Wentz who I know we'll have thoughts on as a pure cash quarterback this week against that brutal Jaguars uh, secondary some of the bad matchups the Saints Panthers Chiefs sadly even though they're Sunday night I throw them in there Jets and Broncos uh, through the air I would say you know I think a bit of it's tongue-in-cheek but the whole Mike White uh, kind of era, <laughs> era we're starting to live in like maybe people are like wait like wait <laughs> the Jets I, I just can't imagine that we, we, we got Zach Wilson saying he wants to be more like Mike White now like it's <laughs> and I know what he's saying because Mike White literally is so far the most check down heavy quarterback in the league like that's why they came back so well and it worked out and he got his win it was fun but he is throwing five yard passes uh dump downs to michael carter and ty johnson repeatedly wouldn't necessarily expect uh, too much out of these receivers in this one particularly with Corey davis coming back and further muddling up this room all right let's scroll down just a little bit in your article to pace this is one of the things i pay most attention to uh the more snaps you get the more plays in theory What are some games? uh, I see this Atlanta Dallas game looks like it should have a lot of plays in it. That looks to be uh, one of the big points people are looking at for DFS so far this week. Uh, That that Indianapolis game, very slow. We will talk about Carson Wentz if he's in the cards for us. Uh, Anything else really standing out to you? Cowboys game number one then you know hopefully produce some good football but Sunday night and Monday night football are also popping as well also Tampa Bay and Washington so I do think that with the way the Buccaneers receivers are setting up with AB out doing some Brady with uh, Mike Evans potentially Godwin stacks if he is going to be active makes sense and he can bring it back with either a Terry McLaurin or hey maybe even uh, Ricky Seals Jones with Logan Thomas out for another week so I think there might be some sneaky game stack appeal in that Tampa Bay Washington 
Washington one. I get Heineke is a bad quarterback and he really looked terrible in that Broncos game before their bye. We've seen him put together like some good enough weeks. Like again, I'm not maybe even like a JD McKissick game. I'm not saying to stack the Washington offense, but I think they might have enough in them to uh, bring back some value there. And then, yeah, you said it with the indie game, also seeing the Browns and the Patriots as an especially slow matchup and that Seahawks Packers game. I mean, I know on paper, Russ versus Rogers, you would think this might be a ton of points going to be scored here back and forth game. But with the way these offenses operate more weeks than not, and with Rogers coming off the layoff, um, I'm more inclined to kind of think this could be an under scenario. Anything be slower than that horrible Thursday night Ravens offense we saw last night? That was so horrendous. <laughs> it's down one second, or basically they hit zero on almost every play I watched during that game. Just an absolutely uh, hor- horrific offense. And as soon Alpha, as they the sped Ravens. it up, they started actually moving yeah. the ball like consistently. Oh my F- God. Funny how that works. <laughs> uh, let's keep going down here. Let's look at pressure rate. Uh, Maybe some defenses that can get to the quarterback. Uh, So maybe that's a a plus for defense, minus for quarterback, and maybe some quarterbacks that can have a clean pocket. Uh, That is always a plus when you're trying to hit upside in tournaments. So what is looking good and bad this week? Yeah, it's, you know, it's always good when we have the same guys popping in explosive pass plays in the pressure metric in terms of having a clean pocket, because then hopefully they'll have time to actually take advantage of those downfield mismatches. Once again, see Big Ben here. Once again, see Dak here and Mr. Tom Brady. Again, like this Washington team really, team really has funneled production through the air. Teams, it's kind of similar to Tampa Bay. Like teams don't want to run into Chase Young, Montez Sweat, Jonathan Allen, all these, you know, treasure chest of first round picks they have in that D-line. So they've been throwing the ball downfield with a lot of success so far so i do think brady and company coming off the bye could be a great tournament option some of the more worse off quarterbacks mike white again i mean the bills are just so good on d and i think i did see tremaine Edmonds could be out obviously that could uh, change things a little bit there particularly uh in their in, in their ability to impact the running backs in the check down game but yeah just uh, not much other than michael carter i'm interested in the jets this week Carson Wentz popping here. It is just kind of more a factor of earlier in the season when the Colts O-line wasn't as healthy. At the same time, though, Jaguars defense, uh, number three in pressure rate this year. Got to give them a little bit of credit uh, for knocking off the Bills. It wasn't all just Josh Allen and company falling on their faces. So something to keep in mind a little bit there with not going too heavily potentially on that Colts offense. We got some red flags shown, to be fair. And then also P.J. Walker, who I don't think many are expecting much out of, but maybe he can at least throw the ball at Christian McCaffrey and dozen times a game yeah that's what i'm hoping for at least in some tournaments this week here uh going down a little farther into your article again you guys can read this all for free over on pro football focus uh let's look at yards before contact for the running back i was looking at the running back ownership before the show and of course we've got the nick chubb's going to be out news um so dearness johnson he'll probably catapult way up the ownership it was pretty tight before uh later in the week this week on roto grinders over the weekend i'm sure it'll sort of uh, conglomerate around a couple of names here is there anything really standing out i'm noticing the bills but i, I don't know if i can use a, a bills running back uh here ian is there is, is that something we're, we're trying to do this weekend if Zach Moss is out, I think Singletary is a great pivot off the earnest, at least in tournament land, uh, because they're at the same price point. We did see in week one, I know, and it's been up and down in past years when Moss and even Frank Gore were out. Sometimes they would give Singletary a pretty featured role. Other times they would just elevate TJ Yeldon, now Matt Breida, and continue to split things up. In week one without Moss, though, Singletary was at 75% snaps, had like 15 combined carries and targets, and it is the best matchup of the week against the Jets league worst defense and fantasy points per game allowed to opposing backs so tournaments i think we could get behind singletary if moss is out also have the vikings popping one of these games dalvin cook if he's out there and if not alexander madison uh obviously we know he can do it as well is going to have a true blow up game chargers defense just devotes so many more resources to uh the secondary it could be this week zico elliott and the cowboys looking good natural bounce back spot you know if everyone's on deck in the passing game maybe we load up on zeke he is a little bit banged up but he should be out there and then actually the lions which is surprising to me i think deandre swift could be a real sneaky tournament play jamal williams if if he hasn't been ruled out already he hasn't been practicing all week and swift like okay he busted the week before the bye that was unfortunate but it was only because he fumbled like right at the end of the third quarter when they were already down like five touchdowns so not saying that couldn't necessarily happen again but usually he feasts during that fourth quarter he's a jalen hurts of running backs and if we can get a little more success than usual on the ground in the meantime obviously that's good things 
Running games not set up as well. Tennessee, Jets, New England, and Atlanta. Uh, obviously, with Cordero Patterson, we're getting so much work as a receiver. I don't think it matters as much. Keep an eye on um, these Patriots running backs, Damon Harris and Ramondre Stevenson, DMP, all week in the concussion protocol. And Brandon Bolden, man, we might not like it. It's not the sexiest thing. But again, if we want to get off of the, the Ernest Johnson chalk and tournaments, he's another guy that gives us that option. John U. Smith running back. Are we going to see a couple of couple Ooh, of that this week? I'm down, man. They gave him that <laughs> toss from the I formation a couple years back. It looked good. Yeah, I'll have to see how that goes. Uh, all right, let's keep going down on your article here on Pro Football Focus. Let's look at combined yards per drop pack. Sort of goes hand in hand with the explosive play yeah. rate. We want the quarterbacks that can throw it deep. You, you've got Ben Roethlisberger, but without Claypool. I mean, it's good at Deontay. He he can still catch those sometimes, but he looks set up to have a good game. Not that that maybe is a little interesting in terms because not it's going to be Najee with the Ernest is certainly going to be like the chalk running back combo people are using. So maybe there's something there for tournaments. Is there anything else really standing out to you? Yeah, it basically just reflects what we're seeing with the explosive plays. It is tough. I mean, in my original um, cash game builds, I wanted to have Deontay in there, but then it became him. And do I want him? Do I want two Steelers uh, players in my uh, team? Not necessarily, because I could see this being a bit of an overlooked situation. Uh, we'll get to that in our best bets, though. Final note, though, uh, Pat Fryermuth, people, we got to get off him uh, this week. Eric Ebron is back, practice in full on Thursday. I, I will see if he has an injury designation, but with him, expected to return i think frymouth should be pushed forward more but what we just see in the ravens game with bateman and sammy Watkins, i know bateman had a you know good enough game but Watkins was way more involved than pretty much anyone was giving him credit to have been so yeah should have had that touchdown absolutely man but like if alligator arms there, yeah then that's bateman out there so like it's not that ebron himself is a threat to frymouth long term but when we're starting to cut a tight end snaps and routes as severely as ebron might uh just try to find a better option uh, any offenses that are, you know, Mike White combined yards per drop back, not looking really good. T T Taylor Heineke. Uh, I do like McLaurin as like a deep tournament sleeper has that boom bust potential. I think he's slightly interesting if they really have to, to pass a lot, but is there any, Someone any on Washington? Yeah. Bringing it back from Tampa Bay. Cause Tom Brady's looking like, again, the best uh, bet. Yeah. And we also saw on the pressure mark. So I think that would be kind of the issue when we go back to that wild card game they had last year that was kind of the success Washington would have against Brady the ability to knock him off his spot in the pocket but man like Tampa Bay this year third and team PFF pass blocking grade and Brady has the second quickest release in the league so I think he's uh you know figured out a way how to overcome those demons and then it's just you know how many points can you score against that secondary all right let's look at the combined EPA per play uh, your thing over the past couple of years has been looking for underdogs that have the advantage in EPA per play. Is there anything standing out this week? Yeah, well, one of them is in my best bets, the Browns uh, against the Patriots. Just, I think it's more of a factor of uh, the Browns defense being a lot better than people are necessarily giving them credit for. Patriots have been winning games largely based on their defensive dominance. Mac Jones has been more good than bad, but hey, I mean, I, I still can't really wrap my mind around Baker being so much better without Odo Beckham, but you know what? It's the reality. It's the world we live in, Britt, and uh, OBJ is out of there. So Browns offense, you know, I think is better than the Patriots, and I think the defense for the Browns is better as well. Also have the Vikings um, over the Chargers. It, it's just mm -hmm. Vikings, one of the weirdest teams to try to predict out there. You know, I, uh, it's Chargers as well, honestly. Like this is just going to be a wild game. Wouldn't necessarily lay that, but I do think it will be competitive. And then also whew, Raiders against the Chiefs, man. It's one of those things where it's like, all right, we know Mahomes and company are going to snap out of it. But at the same time, Raiders have looked better on offense and defense than the Chiefs all season long. So like, should we really expect that to change Sunday night? Yeah, the Raiders can. I think they can win that game, no problem. Yeah. Uh, against the with, with unless there is some complete turnaround again, you know, with the Chiefs' offense and how they're acting, uh, I, I think the Raiders can win that. It, I don't it have could that. happen, but based on what we've seen so far, like I wouldn't call it inevitable this Sunday by any stretch. Yeah. Uh, so that's going to wrap it up for the recap of Ian's mismatch manifesto. Uh, you can go read that over on Pro Football Focus, uh, and if you want to listen to anything Ian does on the Pro Football Focus podcast. Uh, go subscribe over there and give him a listen uh, shows basically every day of the week. Uh, and uh, while we're talking about podcasts, uh, you know, some of you listen to this uh, on Friday night, on Saturday, over the weekend uh, on the Roto Grinders podcast feed. If you don't uh, and you want to get our show delivered right to you, please go subscribe to that. And if you are watching live on YouTube or 
Uh, if you're watching a, a little bit later, we do get plenty of people who watch the video on demand. Uh, please give it a like if you like the content. And uh, if you want to get notifications uh, every time a Roto Grinders show goes live, please click the subscribe button. There are a million shows here on Roto Grinders. All of them are great and they will get uh, what basically directed right to you if you click that subscribe button. Uh, all right, let's go to the bets of the week. And I'm going to start off with, you know, I, I think every time this year I've been like, this is the one line of the week that makes absolutely no sense to me. I had, uh, it was like the Patriots against the Panthers. I think that was a big win. There was another one earlier in the season that made absolutely no sense. That was a big win. Um, and I, th- I got one more for you this week. It's uh, the Rams are minus three and a half against the 49ers. This makes no sense to me. I, what baffles my mind even more is I bet this on Monday at four or four and a half. I went today and it was at three. (laughs) I just, I just, I don't understand this. The Rams are a far, far superior team than the 49ers. The 49ers, is is it just like George Kittle coming back that has moved this line? Um, Maybe he's going to play a little bit more. I don't know. They turn the ball, the 49ers turn the ball over so much. They stink at home. The Rams are one of the best teams. I think the Rams, the Bucks are probably like the only two what I would consider like teams you could see in the Super Bowl at this point in time. The AFC is completely wide open, in my opinion. I still keep the Cowboys in there, but I, I know I know what you're saying. We'll, we'll see. Well, yeah, look, the, the AFC is just totally wide open. All the, yeah. all the really good teams, I think, are in the NFC. And the 49ers are not on that list. This should be like minus seven. I think the Rams are like a touchdown favorite. So getting this a three and a half uh, looks pretty good. Uh, you want to talk about the Browns. I did bet the Browns too. I'm in agreement with you on this one. So let's just go a little bit further on why we like the Browns here. Yeah. I mean, again, I just think that with miles Garrett there, like you're looking at a top three pass rush and it's something where Mac Jones, okay. He's been good this year. He's been the best rookie quarterback, but when all of a sudden you're starting to disrupt his ability to operate in those underneath intermediate areas of the field where they need to, it's a problem. And like, look, they haven't really relied on him last week. He threw the ball 18 times now Damon Harris and Ramondre Stevenson the two guys that you kind of want to play this bully ball football with are out I mean it's just one of those things where I'm not saying a running back is ever really moving the spread I get why the line wouldn't move with those guys out but it's not great that now we're asking Mac Jones to really shoulder more responsibility than he has all year against Miles freaking Garrett Denzel Ward in a defense that just shut down Joe Burrow and the Bengals so yeah and then that's even before looking at Baker and company who again without OBJ for whatever reason and have been able to do their thing and they could be down they are down running backs we have Chubb and company out at the same time we at least do have an example game against the Broncos where they were able to still instill their will on the ground with Dearness Johnson yeah uh, my other one I totally agree if the Browns are able to get pressure on Mac Jones and by all accounts should be able to I think it's going to be a long day for Mac Jones especially if they get out to uh, if the Browns get out to a lead, I think there is very little chance of Mac Jones being able to bring them back in that game. Uh, the one I, other one I got this week is the Chargers. They're minus three uh, against uh, the, the Vikings here. And I just, uh, the Vikings are just, I don't know. I don't think they call plays good. They, you know, I think they should probably try to run the ball a ton in this game because I, I love Dalvin Cook and DFS. Um, and they should try to get Justin Jefferson the ball. Uh, more than a couple times per game like they have. And, you know, there's some coach speak. They're going to try to do that. But I don't know. I just don't – I don't trust the Vikings play call. And you know who I do trust? Brandon Staley to try to put up some points every single game. You know the Chargers are coached correctly in an attempt to win NFL games. I think that's pretty clear. Uh, they're, they're not the same old Chargers. That's the quote that's been going around, and I would agree completely on that one. Uh, I think they're the better team here. I think they're the better offense. I think they're the better defense. They're basically just getting the home field advantage of the, the minus three in this game here. Uh, I'll take that all day long with the Chargers at home, so that's probably the other one along with the Browns. But the one I really like, if you had to make one bet this week, is definitely the Rams to me. Um, I was looking a little bit at the Steelers, Ian, at uh, I think it was eight. It might even be up to eight and a half now. You're on the Lions here, and I think I, I looked at it, and I was just like, you know what? I don't know if I trust the Steelers. They really couldn't do it against the Bears. Thankfully, the refs bailed me out uh, on a couple of bets I made on that one to win here. But why do you like the Lions coming out of the bye here? At this point, man, they got – 
they're looking down the barrel of having one of those winless seasons. And I think we're going to see one of their best punches coming out of that bye that they really have left against a Pittsburgh team that is convincing everyone their contenders for the second straight year when we know that they are actually frauds. You look at this little four game win streak that they're on. Credit to them. Win is a win is a win. But come on, you beat the Teddy Bridgewater led Broncos, Geno Smith, the Browns off the bye, and a Bears team that didn't even look like they could move the ball until they faced the Steelers. So at this point, I don't think their defense is as good as past years and i'm not saying the lions are necessarily going to go get that w but if they're like i don't think pittsburgh deserves to be favored by eight and a half against anyone is basically the big point i'm getting out here to me this is a couple points too high and i think the lions can keep it within a touchdown please if they can't do it against pittsburgh man it's gonna be tough to find a squad that they can but i do think they offer some value the browns plus two and a half again and then also uh we were talking about this uh with Dr. Eric Eager on our PFF show rehearsal um, today um, at the headquarters. But yeah, Saints Titans under 44 and a half is one of the favorite plays of the week from the PFF Sharps. Just a slow, gross game between, look, two offenses that will probably be without their offensive identity and Derrick Henry and probably Alvin Kamara, backup quarterback Simeon again for the Saints. I mean, he hasn't been terrible, but like Sean Payton was saying this where he was a lot better than he kind of looked because of the playmakers not making plays plays around him like that's not something that's going to be fixed they don't have any yeah. playmakers on this offense Simeon is a true sum of his parts quarterback and the sum of his parts is not worth much right now particularly with Kamara out of the picture Titans defense has been playing very well last few weeks and hey man this Saints defense they know how to stop the run and if Marshawn Lattimore is able to hold up you know with AJ Brown and or Julio Jones I do think this kind of has gross like 17 to 10 game written all over it yeah, Mark, the Mark Ingram game, I feel like it's going to be coming this week if Alvin Kamara is probably. There's a lot of cheap running backs once we get into all that sort of stuff there for are, DFS yeah. purposes here. Uh, all right, so that's going to wrap up our bets of the week. Uh, we're going to get to DFS, but before we do, uh, I need to tell you guys a little bit about Jock Market. Stop throwing your money away. It's time to check out Jock Market, the app where daily fantasy becomes a stock exchange. Buy and sell shares of players in real time for real money. Uh, you can download it now for a 100% deposit match up to $50 using promo code grinders. That means you deposit 50, you get another $50 instantly to use immediately on jock market. Uh, and get this, if you happen to lose in your first market, the first time you ever play on jock market, they will refund you up to that $100 of free play. So go check them out for free using promo code grinders with that 100% deposit match. And uh, go start buying and selling shares of players in real time. I have personally tried this out. It is a fun little product. Uh, do not be afraid to step out of your normal DFS routine uh, when checking out some of the new sites out there. Uh, let's jump into some quarterback talk this week. And uh, on my third, I played Lamar Jackson on my Thursday game. So I'm like, Lamar Jackson's great. It's the Dolphins. That did not go out, out too well. And um, there's not like a must have quarterback this week. Ian. sometimes we'll look at last week was the Lamar. We were all jamming in Lamar Jackson, I think in our cash games, because it made a ton of sense that obviously did not work out for me on the Thursday games. So I'm going to throw a couple of players. I think are in the mix at you and see what sticks here. I think it's Dak Prescott. If we can assume some volume will be there. And I, I don't think his efficiency is going to last all season with how efficient he's been. So I, I really need to see some volume uh, and we know Dallas wants to run when they get up. So we got to see how that game plays out, but he's 6,900, which is a very nice price on DraftKings.com. Uh, and if he can get, you know, two and a half touchdowns, three touchdowns, something like that. I think he's probably the guy you want to spend up on. You don't need to get to the Josh Allen's Kyler Murray's 8,000. Definitely not playing him. I don't think I'd play him if he was 6,200 or something like that this week with, um, how, how his performance sort of goes down if, if he's dinged up. So we're looking at Dak, and then there's a couple of 6K quarterbacks. I sort of like Matt Ryan opposite in that game because if Dallas does get out, we know Matt Ryan, and the, the Falcons have almost given up on running the ball. They're just chucking the ball over the field now. Cordero Patterson has turned them into an elite passing offense. So congratulations to you, Ian, on yes, that sir. one. Yes, sir. And we've got Carson Wentz at home in a dome against the Jaguars. Uh, you did mention in the pace that we went over from your article, that game is going to be slow, um, but Wentz can certainly pop off for 250 plus and get his two to three touchdowns. He has a little bit of rushing upside too mixed in there as well. 
before that game even gets out of hand. And if for some reason that game does stay close, they will be passing throughout the entirety of that game, which is always good here. So my question to you is, are your builds looking better with the the cheaper quarterbacks or do you think Dak is a little bit safer and worth paying up for? I think the more I come around to Michael Gallup being a nice stacking partner for Dak in the cash game build, even the more I do like paying up for him. Because if we can save that salary, I do think it works. Previously, I was looking more at Carson Wentz with Michael Pittman and then going from there. But if we can save that extra salary there, we know we have Dearness already. We'll get to tight end, but uh, we can save some money there. And even going extra cheap because you can just punt at defense and take like Jacksonville towards the bottom. I mean, you know, I don't know if Carson Wentz has earned true cash game treatment. Again, this is a game against the Jaguars defense that doesn't have a great secondary, but they do have a good pass rush. And that has kind of been the problem for Wentz. I mean, we're only a week removed from him having maybe the single worst interception of the season where he was, you know, falling back in his own end zone. Like the guy has not just completely morphed back into 2017 Wentz at this point. So I realized Dak and this Cowboys offense looked atrocious last week, but again, based on a lot of these things we're seeing about the, Falcons matchup I, I like their chances to get back on track so I do start to lean more towards Dak and Gallup Britt would you want to stack him with Gallup and uh CD Lamb or you think just one is fine because you probably, probably just make it work you sort of need you, you can do a lot this week especially with the Ernest Johnson if we get Kamara ruled out right you can I think Mark Ingram would certainly be in play at his price tag um, I think Dalvin Cook's, you know, there's no sign of Dalvin Cook not playing. So I don't think we get Alexander Madison or anything like that. Yeah. So like you can do a lot of stuff, but I, you need the builds I was sort of looking at is I sort of need that sub. I need a sub 5k receiver that I feel comfortable with. Yeah. And I can go all the way down to Gallup at 4k because when, when Gallup's in there, he'll, he'll get his targets and it's a, it's a good Good opportunity for him this week coming back. Uh, I think he's probably very reasonable at 4K. I think you can stack them together if you have to. I think that makes sense. Um, all right. So for tournaments, if we're if we're on deck for cash, and I, I I think you can maybe even use Matt Ryan, honestly, if you're you're really salary saving. What are some tournament uh, options you're looking at this week, Ian? Because I think the the ownership is going to get pretty congregated on deck, and uh, I think. Matt Ryan, and I think people will still go back to Josh Allen. Uh, is the too high safety going to ruin Josh Allen for a second week in a row against the Jets? You do want to run against the Jets, but we'll see how that plays out. Uh, what else is there to really go to this week? Yeah, again, I like this Vikings Chargers game a lot this week. That's kind of my main tournament spot I want to go to. I understand you always have the Dalvin Cook blow up games possibility, but this Vikings offense really as a whole this year hasn't been quite as run heavy as we've seen uh, in the past. And we're starting to see, I think, a big time squeaky wheel opening for Justin Jefferson. We got Gary Kubiak talking now or, you know, yeah, I think it's Gary right now, but. We got them talking about, you know, him needing to get more targets than he has over the past two weeks. And he's facing a charger secondary down a starter in Michael Davis. And honestly, like, I just don't think there's a secondary out there that can hold him in check much anyway. So I love the thought of going with like a Herbert Keenan or Mike Williams stack against an equally banged up and bad Viking secondary, bringing it back on um, the, on the other side as well. So or, yeah, I got to twist it up a little bit, but you guys know what I'm saying here. Also mentioned before Tom Brady and going that route against Washington, do the pressure, do the secondary advantages. And Brett, it also is just pretty cool what you can do with Matt Ryan, where there's not a wide receiver we can use, but you can kind of make these unique builds by having Cordero Patterson at RB and having Kyle Pitts at tight end or even flex, honestly, because he essentially plays wide receiver. So you have Matt Ryan with his two top pass game options. None of them happen to play wide receiver. Yeah, we're lacking at uh, high quality tight ends. I mean, I think every week we're lacking at high quality tight ends, but specifically we are because we don't have uh, the ghost of Travis Kelsey or Darren Waller's week one, 19 targets. Those guys are not there. So Kyle Pitts, he does give you that wide receiver upside at the tight end position. I'm totally fine using him in a, you know, if like looking at this week, he's, I, I don't normally like the, the two tight end builds, but if I was going to do a tight end build, our two tight ends, uh, Kyle Pitts would probably have to be one of them to, to meet my criteria because he is definitely a wide receiver sure. at the tight end position. Uh, a couple quarterbacks I like for tournaments. Uh, I'm gonna play. I'm gonna play the the Chargers uh, offense of this week, which is 
Teddy Bridgewater. They're going up against the Eagles here. And I'm going to, I'm going to take the dink and dunk uh, combination with Jerry Judy in that one. Now there is some, uh, their offensive coordinator uh, just got ruled out for COVID. Uh, so I, I don't know if that's really going to change too much. It seems pretty obvious how you want to attack this Eagles offense. The chargers just laid the game plan, chuck it to the slot receiver, Keenan Allen, chuck it to the slot receiver, Jerry Judy, uh, 15 times in this game. Sounds pretty good. I do worry a little bit if the Broncos are able to get up, of course, they're going to run. Um, but if the Eagles are able to keep pace, I think it's pretty easy. You do Bridgewater to Judy and you've got two very easy run backs in either Goddard or Devonte Smith. If you want to run back, you don't really have to run it back this year. If you don't want to, it's a very different NFL compared to last season. I've been going over that in my millionaire maker articles. Um, but that's one I was looking at to really save you a, a little bit of salary. And then the other one I was looking at is no one wants to play uh, Russ, right? He's back. And you know, that game's probably going to be slow. But that doesn't really stop Russell Wilson when he's on from having 270 plus yards and four touchdowns with a rushing touchdown and a cut, you know, you really only have to like that stack them. Yeah. You only really have to stack them with either Lockett or DK. You don't really have to double stack. Those two never really go off together. You got the tight end special of the week, Mr. Gerald Everett, if you wanted to do something cheap in that one. Uh, so that's one I'm looking at, at what's really looking like a, a low owned Russ. Uh, if he's allowed to cook, uh, looks pretty good for him. The, the Seahawks need to let him cook because if he's not, that this is going to be his last season in Seattle. He's going to basically force his way out of there, I think, at the end of the year if they don't let him do something. Yeah, I like that call a lot. With uh, Teddy, I just think there's not really enough upside to warrant him. Jerry Judy, absolutely. We'll talk about him more in a minute, but I think he nailed it on the Seahawks one. Similar kind of position for Metcalf as it is with Justin Jefferson uh, with what I was saying. So I still think this Packers secondary is a little bit um, overrated. They haven't had Jair Alexander. They're great with him. Like, we really don't think Metcalf can just take Kevin King and, like whoever else they got out there to score here. If you look at who the Packers have been playing, I mean, they get absolutely roasted by Jamar Chase and they get to play the Bears who – or we're bearing around, you know, Terry McLaurin goes off. They play the Cardinals. Hopkins has a huge gain and pulls his hamstring, like within 10 minutes of the game starting. And then last week, I know Patrick Mahomes can't hit a broadside of a barn right now, but we saw Tyreek Hill running past those guys, seemingly every other target he got. So I do love the chance of Seattle. Maybe not in it. Hey, you can always bring that one back with Devonte. I know you're saying you don't need to, but that could be a way of, you know, really paying up there a wide receiver, get a nice little attorney lineup. All right. That's going to do it for the quarterback position. Let's move to running backs. So we've got Nick Chubb officially out. This is the Dearness Johnson show uh, too cheap. Let's go over what he did in his previous start uh, in a similar situation. And he had, uh, what was this? 22 carries for 146 yards and a touchdown against Denver with two targets for 22 yards. Uh, certainly not the fastest player on the field, um, but look good enough. The main thing is, it's funny when, and I think we talked about this on a previous show this year, when the starting running back goes out this year, we've been giving their backup basically a higher projection because all these teams combine running backs now to basically form an RB one. So when the starter goes out, the backup basically gets almost all of the work now. So it's been basically, you know, our RB, you know, zero season and DFS has worked out really well when we've been able to use these guys. He's 4,700 for cash, absolute lock on DraftKings, whatever site you're playing on, you're going to want to use him. I want to talk to you in tournaments. Um, what, what do you, like, these are one of the situations where I'd, I'd probably either like lock him in or go pretty severely under the field. If I had to give you one of those two options, what would you rather do in a situation like this with a guy like Dearness Johnson, given his price tag around the industry? It's tough man because the thing is like as great as the usage you listed was like that was even with Demetric Felton playing he's also mm -hmm. out yeah. so we li it's literally now Dearness Johnson he will probably play over 90 percent of the offensive snaps and at that price point man I don't see a way how he does it how he gets feared in 20 touches so I think I'm probably going to be willing to put him in a still heavy amount of lineups the possibilities it opens up is too much to stray away from and there's a chance maybe in tournaments he isn't quite as owned as we think because of the plethora of other guys that could be, you know, available down there with Ingram, with Bolden, with, uh, you know, another one I'm forgetting right now. So 
I kind of lean towards still trying to put him in Brit. If it was like a Derrick Henry week or something, and it's costing 8K to get all yeah. those guaranteed touches, that'd be one thing. But when you can add a sub 5K running back for this, like, come on. Yeah, I think I would tend to agree with that one. And the main thing is just the 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 run blocking advantage the offensive line has, right? So according to PFF, uh, team blocking, run blocking grades, the Brown third best in the league this year, and the Patriots 21st in PFF run defense grade, just a huge mismatch there. And that'll set up pretty well for Dearness Johnson. So I would again, even if he doesn't have the same success on the ground that he did against the Broncos, now we're looking at five to eight catches in mop up duty potentially. Yeah. Yeah. So I really like him. The other guy who looks extremely popular as it sits right now is going to be Najee Harris. Do you see any reason to not want to use him against the lions? They've allowed the second most fantasy points and Najee, he, we don't need uh, the starter to get ruled out to, to get all the carries with him because he's already getting all of them. Right. I mean, Najee's another one of these guys, just completely independent of game script. He's going to give you an RB one every week. If they get up and they win, he's going for over 20 carries and probably scoring a touchdown. If they fall behind. It might even be better because now he's catching, you know, five plus passes and potentially giving you that. Now we have a chance for actually more efficiency than usual. It's easy. And he even got taken off the injury report already with that foot thing. So no concerns there. I have both them locked in. Um, Britt, I'm with you. Do we want to try to flex? to someone like Jonathan Taylor. I know James Conner is someone that should be seeing a lot of work as well, but the more I look at the Dak Gallup, you know, and saving some salary elsewhere, I do think it's possible to get all the way up to Jonathan Taylor in cash. Like maybe that's just the answer. What are we messing around with Pittman and Wentz for? We have Jonathan Taylor getting over 20 touches against the Jaguars. Yeah, we got to see. Taylor's always, I need that Marlon Mack 1130 inactive. It's been happening. (laughs) I got, I got to see that to to unleash the Jonathan Taylor. So that's always one. I'm always a little hesitant to talk about earlier in the week because I need that to happen because if if Marlon Mack's active, everything goes out the window with Jonathan Taylor, in my opinion. But I agree with that. And I guess for tournaments, it's, it's interesting because I think Dearness Johnson is certainly going to garner. He's the one everybody's going to talk about over the weekend and projections are going to love him. Uh, for good reason, but like we, this is this has to be wrong. Christian McCaffrey is currently projected at a half a percent owned on Roto Grinders right now. That'll probably be a little higher, right? But I expect him to basically go back to Christian McCaffrey of old, getting a ton of checkdowns in this game. We've got uh, with everyone looking at Najee Harris, I think Dalvin Cook and you, you know, your aforementioned Jonathan Taylor are probably going to go lower owned than Najee Harris by a reasonable amount when it's all said and done. Um, and cook against the chargers. I mean, if Jordan Howard and Boston Scott are carving up the chargers, what do you think Dalvin cooks do to do? And may, maybe he's running a little angry this week for all the stuff that's going on in, in the news with him this week. So I think he's fine as a DFS play. Um, I want to get your thoughts on Austin Eckler in a tournament. Cause we've currently our projection ownership projections will certainly um, become much more precise uh, as the weekend sort of comes to, um, but he was very heavily owned last week and disappointed and what that generally means especially when we have all these other sexy names Ian, is his ownership is going to plummet to single digits uh probably even like mid single digits if you ask me by the time it's all said and done uh going up against minnesota well what are your thoughts on him this week one bad week shouldn't move us off of him right no definitely not i even had uh some builds earlier in the week where i was even looking at eckler and cash i think this chargers vikings game is going to have points going up everywhere and the vikings defense they looked really not really good but much better than last year at least for the first seven eight weeks of the year they lost to neil hunter for the season in that cowboys game so when you take away that's their really only real source of pass rush that secondary which is also banged up i think they're down mckenzie alexander and peterson's on ir for another couple of weeks still like it's just going to be problematic against this offense so yeah i think eckler makes uh loads of sense there only other two guys i agree with you 100 with uh christian mccaffrey like the easier builds this week is paying down at running back and paying up at wide receiver pretty easy way to just get, have contrarian lineups reverse that pay up at running back to mccaffrey pay down at wide receiver but the two guys in the middle range that i think we could be forgetting about because of one bad game deandre swift at 6.8k still the undisputed starter with jamal williams out 
and against the Steelers defense that, you know, they're good. But again, what do we want Swift for? Catching passes, more than capable of doing that here. And based on some of the stuff we saw in the mismatch manifesto, could have a little more success than usual on the ground. So I like Swift there to basically get off of some of the chalker guys around him. See Pat, Zeke, Eckler. I guess he's a little more expensive. But and then finally, Michael Carter at 5.6K. Mike White, all he does is check it down. What happened last week in the Thursday night game? He got hurt. So Josh Johnson came in and threw downfield like he usually does. So it was unfortunate. You know, Ty Johnson stole. He didn't steal. I guess he just scored it himself. But he got that receiving touchdown at the end of the game. Could have easily been Michael Carter, a guy that is still dominating the snap share in this Jets backfield ever since their bye week. He was a top six running back, I think, in both of their first two games off the bye. Now we can still get him under 6K. And another, admittedly, disgusting matchup. But I believe Tremaine. Edmonds even got ruled out for Buffalo and that's pretty big he's one of the I think better sideline to sideline linebackers in the NFL at this point so Michael Carter DeAndre Swift anytime we have these running backs that could just you know mess around and catch 10 passes I do think yeah give them a long look especially when they also have command over their team's early down work like these guys do all right let's play uh Will the Ernest Johnson, Mark Ingram, Brandon Bolden lineup? Will that win a million dollars? Gosh. <laughs> then you can just spend up on everything if you want. There's a lot. Who would you rather have? Let's pretend Kamara's out. Let's pretend Harris and Stevenson are out. You rather want Bolden or Mark Ingram? I don't know if I would go down to either in cash. In tournaments, probably Mark Ingram. Who's even their other running back? Ty Montgomery at this point would have to be it. With Bolden, with Bolden, it's just too much with J.J. Taylor, I think. Mark Ingram could be the legit every down guy. Dwayne Washington there, too. I go Ingram. Running back is very deep this week. We didn't even talk about uh, Leonard Fournette. James Connors, another guy who should just get an absolutely, uh, maybe not massive, but a very good portion of the touchdown chances, along with probably getting 15 to 20 touches instead of 8 to 12 touches he was getting earlier in the season with Chase Edmonds. Your boy uh, Patterson is just 6,600. Um, you get the rush, you get some receiving, you get touchdown upside against Dallas. That looks pretty good. Running back is a very, very deep position this week. Yeah, again, I think that Matt Ryan, Kyle Pitts, C. Pat stack is a fun one to do in tournaments. And just quickly, I had to save for defense, but screw it. Remember, people, stacking the running back with the defense as a potential big favorite can lead the perfect game script for all parties involved. So I think Jonathan Taylor and the Colts D, James Conner and the Cardinals D, if no Zach Moss, Devin Singletary and the Bills D, then also Leonard Fournette and that Tampa Bay D. That's a pretty good one, Britt, because again, it does make sense for things to go to the air, but that's why all the ownership is in the air. We're still looking at Leonard Fournette probably seeing 20 plus touches. And out of all the guys that are likely to see that amount of workload, he's probably getting less attention than most. His rush prop was like 53 or five yards. Or he something catches like that. plenty of passes too. Yeah. I mean, I, I, well, I was talking about, I like the, the rush prop over on him. Um, no, that's fair. I just mean, overall, he can get there multiple ways. Uh, all right. Uh, we're going to talk wide receivers in just a second. Before that, uh, Roto Grinders Premium, if you guys want to check that out. If you want to play NFL and basketball and everything else we have to offer here, you can get a subscription that covers all sports all in one. If you're just listening to this football podcast and you're a football diehard, if all you need is football advice, you can just do Roto Grinders Premium by sport. Uh, so if you were interested in that, don't feel uh, left out if you felt you were getting, you know, jipped because you didn't want to pay for premium. If all you want to do is NFL, we got you covered here. Uh, basically, any way you dice it up here. Uh, all right. Wide receiver, Ian, I guess this is, I want to have like a conversation with you because usually every week there's like, I got to have this wide receiver uh, in cash games as a smash. And I was having a little difficulty and it's mainly due to some injuries here. So We've got a couple guys. We've got Chris Godwin, who, if he plays, what's your thought on him dealing with a foot injury? He's 7,100, which is, I believe, his highest price of the season. But against Washington, this looks to be a pretty good spot. It's an early game. We should know he's a game time decision. There's a Schefter tweet overnight. It's 1130. Chris Godwin's in full workload, no limitations. Are we playing him this week? 
I don't really want to, man. I don't think we have to play him. And if he is actually going to be like a lesser version of himself, which is sure, sure sounds like it's on the table for him to be a game time decision. We've seen Arians have like Gronk active for emergency purposes only. Uh, no, I, in, in a week where we don't really have to worry about it that much, I don't see paying up for Goblin. If anything, if Goblin's out, I would just be more inclined to get on to Mike Evans there. The way, again, my cash lineup is looking right now, though, I do think getting down to Gallup at 4K, Stack them with Dak. Judy at 5.3. I agree with everything you're saying against the Eagles in the zone heavy defense. I think we're going to see almost like a repeat of what Keenan Allen was able to do last week, sitting in open zones, getting fed the ball. And if you just look at the three games this year where the Broncos have had Judy and everyone else, Judy has 19 targets. Next closest guys at like 13. Colin Sutton's all the way down at eight and nine. So everything going his way there. And that lets you with a couple other things we're doing, get all the way up to Devontae Adams, who only costs 7.9 K. So Devonte is the one where you don't need to get there, but if I can, man, absolutely. Coming back with Aaron Rodgers, he's been quiet for a few weeks and I don't think anyone in the Seattle secondary really has a chance uh, to guard him. So a lot of vi viable options. I mean, I'm not discounting Goblin. There's CD lamb there. Most unrealized air yards of last week, Evans, Deontay, like Metcalf. We talked about Justin Jefferson. And his what about, about Keenan Allen? He's That's like, he, he's, he's, he's coming eating lately. Yeah. He's coming back as like, we had the Mike Williams couple of weeks where he was the off Keenan Allen never gets in the end. If you get the touchdown, he's certainly going to get there, yeah. but you need, you need, you, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get those what nine to, I don't know, 15 targets, probably not generally that high. And he's going to catch most of them. And he has a reasonable chance of hitting that hundred yard bonus week in week out. If you like that game as a shootout, you got to like Keenan. It's everyone in that range. And that's like, I've had builds where I take like three wide receivers in that range, but it's just one of those things where maybe because I, I like them all a lot. I, I, I don't know which one to pick. So when I can just still have some good running backs, but get down with Gallup and Judy who don't have the same double digit target mm -hmm. projection, but they could get there. Like it's still in their range of outcomes. And then if I can just bypass that, mild uncertainty to get to Devontae. I think I'd like to do that. If Godwin's out, let's say he doesn't play. Tyler Johnson's 3,300. He projects as their slot receiver. That's how you beat Washington. Does yeah. does that interest you at the 3,300 instead of a, a guy like Michael Gallup? Yeah, it definitely. I mean, that's the thing with Tyler when he hasn't, he's been pretty good this year without Antonio Brown, but like he is more at his core, supposed to be Godwin's backup. So okay. putting him in the slot and then we'd have maybe a returning Scotty Miller, probably a debuting Brashad Perryman uh, working out of the Antonio Brown role. So yeah, that's fine. And I, I would be, uh, you know, open to continuing to tinker uh, in that case. Maybe we can just even get further up than Dak at QB or one of these spots. But yeah, man, I just think uh, it's a fun week. There's a lot of uh, different ways to go. Don't sleep on James Washington at 3,500. Again, Claypool has been ruled out. And I think, you know, I don't know, he's just not getting much love. Maybe I'm a, one of the only Washington truthers still out there, but I do think he can make some plays happen downfield. And if Tyler Johnson, if Michael Gallup, if some of these other cheaper wide receivers are getting more of the noise, I don't hate attacking a very winnable matchup with a guy also expecting to see uh, a nice bump in targets this week. All right, let's uh, talk a couple of tournament wide receivers. So basically every week, me and you, have, we've all, always been on the Vikings wide receivers. I think that's fine. There's some coach speak on Justin Jefferson. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. You can, Adam Thielen can catch two touchdowns in any single game. And if Dalvin Cook, I don't know if Cook's going to be ultra popular because there's just such a wide variety of very good running backs this week. Once you get outside of Johnson and Najee Harris, um, so I don't know if you need a ton of leverage, but I do like the Vikings wide receivers. And I mentioned earlier, Terry McLaurin, if you're expecting, let's say you, not even if you're playing Tom Brady, but if you play a Mike Evans or a Tyler Johnson in a lineup, let's pretend if Godwin's out or something like that, you can just add sort of the mini correlation stack into some other stack that you might have on your team with Terry McLaurin, your boy, JD McKissick sometimes, right? there's going to be uh, an opportunity for Washington to throw the ball around the yard because you don't run on the bucks at all. And Washington and Antonio Gibson, it just ain't working out this year. So Washington should be throwing a lot. I like mixing in McLaurin. You, you, are you going to get the five or the 45? You hope it's the 45 in the turn. 
Yeah, I mean, one of those Washington guys, McKissick, RSJ, or McLaurin. Like when yeah. we look at the box score, we're gonna be like, how how did he have nine catches for eighty yards? But it's gonna happen. Uh, only other guy I'll add, I end up I talked about some of my tournament uh, receivers in that last little stretch, but I do think uh, Emmanuel Sanders is someone maybe going a little bit under the radar. And honestly, maybe this Bills passing attack in general, like we do have all these other receivers that can maybe have the slightly better matchups. Jets have been pretty solid enough against the pass this year. But at the same time, like, would it surprise any of us to see Josh Allen just blow this slate wide open and have one of those five touchdown games? I don't think so. I mean, Bills are a team that will continue to pass deep into the game. And if you take away Zach Moss from the equation, it might even lead to a more pass-heavy game script than normal. Josh has been super up and down this year, but he has had some ups. Like, it's not like it's been this consistent downstretch like Patrick Mahomes is kind of going through at this point. So with Josh Allen and just kind of overall these quarterbacks, Backs, Kyler Murray playing banged up, um, Brady potentially being down some weapons, you know, Dak admittedly not looking fantastic. It wouldn't really surprise us if Josh does have one of those QB1 weeks. You can get guys like Manny Sanders, Cole Beasley, maybe even the Diggs week we've been waiting for, returning Dawson Knox. I'm starting to talk myself into it, Britt. Let's get on these bills. <laughs> Yeah, with Knox coming back, I, I think uh, we have currently had Beasley as a reasonable high ownership projection. That should probably knock back a little bit. We saw earlier in the season with Knox, Knox's emergence sort of took Cole Beasley's role a little bit there. They eat into each other, and that's when Manny Sanders was doing good at the start of the year when Knox was healthy. Um, so I do like that Manny Sanders call. Uh, all right, let's go to tight end. Uh, we talk about this week after week. Your lineups just look so much sexier on DraftKings, both cash and tournaments when you're able to find that cheapish tight end that has a, a reasonable role in the passing game and I think there's a couple this week we've been rolling with uh, Dan Arnold for a couple of weeks now DraftKings has refused to raise his price um, he's looking pretty good the Colts are allowing the fourth most fantasy point to tight ends and the second highest success rate on tight end targets uh, that's per our grid iron IQ part of the Roto Grinders premium stuff here on Roto Grinders so he looks pretty good I think he's just 3,500 on DraftKings um, if you want to swerve in tournaments, it's probably Tyler Gronklin, uh, who has be, he's he's rendered Jeff, uh, Justin Jefferson useless in the Vikings offense by sort of stealing those intermediate roles. He's 3,400. And uh, basically, we've got Arnold at 18% ownership. We've got Conklin at 3% ownership. So if that distribution remains the same, what is that, five or six to one in Arnold's favor? I would swerve to Conklin in tournaments. One, he's $100 cheaper, and he's basically got about the same projection as Dan Arnold. We've just we've known we've been using Dan Arnold for a while, so that's probably my one tournament swerve. You got your boy, Ricky Seals-Jones. There's enough cheap running backs. You could play Kyle Pitts in cash this week, and I don't think anyone would fault anybody for doing that, but that's probably the, the range of players. All the way up to Pitts, Dan Arnold, Conklin, about where I'm at this week, Ian. Good point. If I wanted to, because I do think there is enough worry about Jonathan Taylor. If Marlon Mack is active, in particular, getting off Taylor, going down to someone like Mark Ingram, and that lets you avoid playing someone like Gerald Everett, uh, that we'll get to. But yeah, man, I would probably prioritize Gerald Everett as just a cost saving guy, but maybe we don't need to go down that low. Just 2.6K, though. I mean, we were kind of talking ourselves into Will Disley being that guy earlier in the year. And this is a situation where Everett is just a much better more explosive talent guy with the ball in his hands so hasn't had the biggest of seasons but the big issue for him was early on in the year he was playing 70 percent plus snaps every week making some stuff happen got put on the COVID list and it took them three weeks to ramp him back up to his full-time role we did see that before the bye though with a 77 percent snap rate and that win over the Jaguars so Coming out of the bye, Russ is back. I could see Everett being someone that's costing a thousand bucks more this time next week. If you want to go full on cheap tight end, I think Gerald Everett is that guy. And yeah, I agree with you getting off of Arnold with Conklin or RSJ. Can't quite go back the well with Friar Move. Maybe you just fade that idea with Ebron being back. But I, again, I think there's enough salary saving that you can just go up get to someone like Kyle Pitts and, or, you know, a Dalton Knox, Dalton Schultz, I think makes a little sense as well. Um, don't, yeah, don't necessarily need to go too cheap at tight end this week. All right. I'll let you give a couple of defenses uh, right before we get out of here. Just a reminder for those of you listening, uh, just to recap a couple of injury things you're going to want to pay attention to over the weekend, pay attention to Chris Godwin, uh, pay attention to the Patriots running back situation, something just crossed 
that while both um, Stevenson and Harris did not practice today, they are both questionable. So Come neither on. neither one has been ruled out yet. So keep your eye on what's happening there. Um, Brandon Bolden, not someone we're really trying to get in there, but that does open up a cheap another cheap running back for us to attempt. And he is he would be like a PPR king in in that offense possibly this week if we were to get that. Um, so just keep your eye on, on those. Those are the main ones I'm looking at. Uh, a couple of defenses, Ian, cash games, tournaments, and then uh, we'll wrap this up here. Yeah, so I've been kind of settling on the Titans at 2,600. The only cheaper home defense is Washington. We're not going to touch them against Brady, but Titans 2,600 against a backup quarterback. And just, again, potentially without Alvin Kamara could be a good situation. Um, if you really want to go as cheap as possible and save more money, I think the Jaguars at 2,200 based on some of those pressure stats um, we were talking about earlier make some sense. Tournaments, uh, I listened to these before, but just one more time. Jonathan Taylor and the Colts, James Conner and the Cardinals, Devin Singletary with no Zach Moss and the Bills, and Leonard Fournette with the Buccaneers, I think are kind of higher priced, but potentially contrarian RB DST stacks. All right, that's going to wrap it up for the week 10 edition of the Pro Football Focus Show. Uh, Ian, it's been fun. Glad to have you back. As good of a job as Andrew did uh, filling in for you. Uh, we will see you next week. Uh, same time, same place, everybody. Uh, for Ian, I'm Britt. Thanks for watching, listening, downloading, YouTubing, liking, subscribing, clicking everything. Thank you, everybody. We appreciate it. I'm going to make you hold that pose, Ian, no, for another 15 <laughs> seconds. All right. Uh, for Ian, I'm Britt. Thanks for watching, everybody. And we out, Chef.